So why then did we have uh, a focus on women for this winter's program? And why we have uh, a topic such as an inspiring female role model tonight? Well, it was because the oldest member of the society, Ms. Susan Ross, would have been uh, 100 in March, but uh, unfortunately uh, she died at, in, at the end of May last year. But nevertheless, we went ahead and decided to have this as our theme. Now, Susan was a very active member of the society. Uh, she spoke in members' nights. Uh, she participated in outings, walks, and was a regular attendee over decades. In fact, she was a member long before I joined the society. So it goes back uh, quite a long time. And she will be known to many people here in many different roles. As most of you know, Susan was an Auchinloch resident and she lived in this cottage here, uh, which has now been built around by the new development in Auchinloch and she was an active member of the Community Council. Um, she also then spent uh, all her life in education. She uh, taught uh, in local schools before she became the first head teacher of Meekle Hill Nursery School, which was the only school of its kind in Strathkelvin, as it was at that time. In fact, uh, I know that Susan taught a number of uh, members of the society, even quite senior members of the society as well. Because the next few slides are quite cluttered in cases with uh, other individuals, I've just for convenience circled Susan here, easy to spot as I'm flicking through them. Uh, coincidentally, my wife Ruth uh, succeeded uh, Susan as head teacher in 1984 of Meekle Hill. So uh, Susan was the head of Meekle Hill from 74 to 84. She did 10 years there after it opened and then Ruth continued through until it closed in 2006. But uh, Susan is also well known in uh, scouting circles. And these two photographs show Susan back with uh, some of the staff of Meekle Hill uh, on staff night outs and this type of thing, social events. And she still kept her coffee cup in the staff room of Meekle Hill. It was always ready for her when she came back. Uh, she's also a member of Lindsay Old Parish Church. And here she is. Uh, helping to put up the new weather vane following the restoration of the spire there in 2015. Now I should point out that the photograph in the middle, uh, Susan is not one of these two people uh, going up the ladder here, but uh, she helped uh, pull the weather vane to the top. A very faithful supporter and I've just gone through my own archive of photographs and identified those for Susan is in the group. So here she is in Lennox Town on a local history week walk in 2006. Uh, the Waterside Walk, uh, 2005, these two are out of step. Uh, Don, uh, in most cases, uh, leading the walk and giving the, the talk as well. 2009, the Kirkentillic Bypass, that is the, the road round by McNair's, or at least the the old road beside it was one of the first uh, Scottish bypasses of the time. And then she was a regular on summer outings, way back among my photographs, 2004, Hill of Tarvet. Uh, the Duplin Cross and Scone Palace, uh, 2006. 2007, the Rothwell Cross and the Fleece Museum. 2008, Bigger and Traquair House. 2016, Homewood House and the National Museum of Rural Life, East Cabride. The photograph in the lower right, um, that's not actually the dinner. That is in Homewood House and uh, the table was set in um, a notional way with uh, an appropriate set of, um, of uh, dishes and so on. 2017, Hamilton Mausoleum and Museum. 
for the 18 confirmed in this new museum and the Andrew Carnegie birthplace. And our last outing before lockdown, because uh, 2020, 2021, and also uh, 2022, these outings uh, have all been cancelled. 2019 was the RSS discovery and the VNA in Dundee. Um, also, there was the 75th anniversary dinner, some of you might remember attending, and I think you'll spot uh, Susan here at the table and also on the general group. Um, so I also point out that the book with the light green cover highlights of the uh, its history is available as a download from the website for anybody who doesn't have it under the publications tab. This uh, green version was an update by May Pitcairn of the 50th anniversary edition, which was published in 1983 by uh, Matthew Brown. And then May wrote the um, next 25 years and then were merged together. What about Members' Night? Well, unfortunately, this one, I don't have a photograph of um, Susan taking part, but the one running up to the millennium in 1999 was, um, it featured dramatized extracts from the 1899 edition of the Kirk and Tullock Herald. And Susan was an actor in at least one of the parts, uh, number six, uh, a ticket for at Lindsay, but also others, I believe. Um, 2007, my favorite museum, in her case, it was People's Palace. 2008, my favorite history book, it was a biography of uh, Queen Victoria. 2010 was Homecoming. Uh, now, the two documents here were both linked to Homecoming, but sort of Homecoming in reverse, because the printed page to the left uh, was uh, the account of um, a presentation made to Susan's grandparents before they set off to visit family in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, that happened quite often, I think, with people moving to the other side of the world only for a matter of weeks or months, perhaps, but they had a proper send-off with presentations and so on, and speeches and a banquet. Uh, Susan grew up in the hotel business, in a sense. Her parents and her grandparents ran hotels in Glasgow and Edinburgh. So, Mr. and Mrs. Ross here shown, this was an Edinburgh Hotel. But on the right here, we have uh, Susan, very recognizably Susan, when she was only uh, three or four years of age with her mother. By the way, um, you may not, uh, Susan lived to a great age, but of course her mother also lived to a reasonable age. And Susan lived in the house in Loch and Loch with her mother up well into her mother in her 90s which itself um, was into the 1990s. So it's not that long ago that Susan's own mother was still alive and living in Loch and Loch. Uh, I don't have a record of what the family photograph was that Susan used in 2015, but that was the last time she spoke to the society in a member's night. Uh, but since then, she attended regularly right up to uh, last time we had uh, live meetings in the Park Centre, the 2019-2020 uh, program, and uh, Susan was always in the front row getting the best view uh, of what was going on. So that is uh, really a little overview, I just wanted to show you of Susan over the years as a member of the society and the, the part that she played, and she played an active part not just as a member of the audience. But uh, being informed that there's going to be a tree planting in Ochenloch on what would have been Susan's 100th, and that is Saturday the 5th of March, probably somewhere about the community centre, and it's been organised by Ochenloch Thursday Club. So that's 2pm Saturday the 5th, if you want to make a note of that. I've been asked to pass back numbers if anybody is wanting to attend, but I imagine that is only if you wish to stay on for refreshments after the planting. 
and the refreshments being organized by Andrea McDowell as the Thursday Club. So um, if you're thinking of staying for whatever is afterwards, then you can just let me know and I'll pass on the numbers to Andrea, or if you made a note of this email address, or if you happen to know her or know the Thursday Club. Right, uh, starting uh, with myself. Um, that was fascinating, Ivan, to hear and to see all these photographs of Miss Susan Moss. Uh, she was certainly inspiring and her career as a teacher and very much more leaves us in no doubt of her dedication to the education of future generations and her service uh, to the community. Women of her generation were energized and outward facing uh, they would certainly not identify easily with the individualism that is so common nowadays. I would like to speak this evening about another inspiring Kirkintilla woman. Uh, so if you could do the first slide. And um, she is my uh, late aunt. I have a few photographs to illustrate um, my talk this evening and I apologize, I only have a few. Um, all of my possessions are currently in storage and uh, my aunt Jenny's um, surviving son David is in fact abroad at the moment so uh, you'll have to make do with what I've rustled up. Um, Jenny Hall, unlike uh, Miss Ross, uh, was married and the life of married women then was shaped by the expectations and constraints uh, of the age. Living a full, happy and fulfilling life and serving the community was interpreted very much in her own way. And she may have been uh, known to some of you. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. I'll tell you uh, a little about uh, Jenny and her, her um, parentage. Um, she was born Janet Callender Wallace and she was born in Deniston on the 29th of June, 1916. The Wallaces uh, lived in Falkland and Fife for several generations and worked there as handloom weavers. Um, her grandfather, John Wallace, was a joiner foreman and was married to Jean. Uh, they came at some point uh, to, to Glasgow and I know that he died in Alexandra Parade in 1915. Uh, Jean died thereafter, uh, where she lived at Novar Drive in 1931. And their son, uh, James Wallace, who was Jenny's father, um, is listed as a commercial traveller. So if we can move on to the next slide. Um, James died on uh, the 7th of February 1917, aged just 34. Um, I have been able to find the gravestone um, online. Um, he was injured uh, in the Great War and was brought back to Winchester where he died. And there's a gravestone in the military cemetery. Um, that is the information uh, contained in the records, uh, which actually uh, show his birth unknown. So obviously I will pass this on uh, to David to um, update uh, the records. Um, he was uh, a gunner in the Royal Garrison Artillery, um, uh, the heavy artillery. Um, so Jenny uh, was aged one um, and her brother John Jared Wallace was about seven at the time of their father's death. Jenny's mother uh, died of uh, cancer um, at Kenmore Avenue, Bishop Briggs, uh, in 1939, aged 55. And it is there that, um, or it was always the case that uh, their family was very close to my own family. So Jenny, um, I was told, stayed with my mum's family for the rest of that year until she married Jack Hall on the 15th of December, 1939. Uh, Jenny's mother, and her grandparents are laid to rest in the old Isle Cemetery. And that lair contains Jenny's and her son Fraser's ashes. Um, Jenny died on the 13th of February, 
2005, age 89. So if we could move to the next slide. Um, so a little about my uh, relationship uh, to Jenny and a little bit about her early life. Um, my mother and Jenny were first cousins. And Jenny's mother, uh, Peril, uh, Margaret, her, her formal name, and my maternal grandmother, Mary, were sisters. My maternal grandparents had a strong bond with uh, Aunt Peril, Jenny and her brother, as you can imagine, because of the early uh, death of Jenny's dad. Um, I believe, or I'm 99% certain, she was educated at the girls' high school. Um, I also believe um, that she went on to become a shorthand secretary, uh, which was her occupation um, before she got married. Uh, she married Jack Hall on the 15th of December 1939, and Jack owned a rubber proofing factory in Bishop Briggs uh, that was located in the left hand side as you went towards Glasgow, uh, just near to where the road crosses over the railway line. Uh, there's a row of flats, and the factory was behind that. Um, they had three sons Kenneth, David, and Fraser. And David survives and um, is currently, uh, were he not abroad, uh, home is in Kent. Uh, the whole family moved to uh, Nine uh, Beaufort Drive in late uh, 1943. They bought the house from the first owners, uh, Maclay of Maclay's Garage. The Town Hall Museum provides interesting information and illustrations in Maclay. They apparently had a fine collection of canaries, and what was to become the kitchen at Nine Beaufort Drive was Maclay's Canary House. We bought the house from Jenny in 1981 and lived there until June uh, 2021. So moving on um, to the next um, slide, please. So um, what, what were her activities? Well, golf, and golf clubs um, were and very important. Uh, Jenny and my mother both inherited golfing genes from their mother and grandmother. Jenny was to become a dedicated golfer and a long-standing member of Kirkintilla Golf Club. She was an institution there. She was a lady secretary for 30 years. There was a dinner to celebrate her service to the club. Uh, Willie Whitelaw, presided at the dinner, which was held in the RAC club. She also became president of the ladies section. Her golf administration was impeccable. Her guiding hand to all lady members was welcomed and appreciated. She was a master of the rules and etiquette of the game and was greatly admired and loved. Her standing was regal. As a matter of the respect in which she was held, a tree has been planted on the course. Uh, I must, however, comment on Jenny's golfing skills. She had a unique golf swing. On her backswing, she twirled the head of the club, but remarkably made a good contact with the ball on her downswing. Her short game and putting were flawless. In bridge, uh, she was a very keen player and she was heavily involved in bridge in Kirkintillic and Lindsay. Uh, bridge evenings and drives were part of her DNA and money was raised on an ongoing basis through these drives and coffee mornings for many, co uh, for many causes, particularly the RNLI, of which uh, I will say more anon. Um, Church for Jenny, uh, she joined uh, St David's, now St David's Memorial Park Parish Church in 1943. She held the office of flower convener for many years. She was an integral part of the St. David's uh, church community, serving its congregation and the wider community. She was also involved in the interchurch ecumenical activities. Uh, in connection with her community work, she was a very active fundraiser uh, for a number of organizations which included the Red Cross and the RNLI. Uh, she received the prestigious Gold Medal Award uh, from the RNLI, 
presented by Sir Richard Branston at uh, the ceremony held in London. Unfortunately, I don't have access to a photograph of that. Um, baking and coffee mornings uh, could not uh, go without mention. Her rock cakes and gingerbread were legendary. This, of course, was the age of the Playtex girdle, uh, when lashings of butter were essential and everything really tasted like your grandmother had made them. Coffee mornings were frequent, run with military precision, great fun and very profitable. She uh, was also interested in politics and was an active member of the Kirkintilloch branch of the Conservative Unionist Association. And she worked hard for the branch, particularly when Willie Whitelaw stood as a candidate for Eastern Bartonshire in 1950 and in 1951. He was, of course, to become the Member of Parliament for Penrith, not having succeeded in Eastern Bartonshire. If we can move on to the next slide. Yes, um, her golfing hero, I don't think I need to tell most of you, was Jack Nicholas. Um, she met him on several occasions and was photographed with him in 1986. The meeting with Nicholas was arranged by Jenny's son Fraser to celebrate her 70th birthday. Jack came off the 18th green at Turnbury uh, on the final practice day and took Jenny inside the clubhouse for tea. They then came out and photos were taken with her sons and grandchildren. An article appeared in the next edition of the Sunday Post with a headline of Jenny Meets Her Hero. Uh, interestingly, um, another Kirky connection with Nicholas uh, was um, through Mr. Anderson, who lived in Crimmon in Woodland Road. Um, he coached Jack in fly fishing. He was a keen fly fisherman. Um, if we could move on to the last slide. Yes, yeah, so my, my last slide, so just memorable moments. I am sure um, there were many mem memorable moments in her life, uh, including holidays in Ely with my family, the Camerons. I remember her dog, Major, getting stuck in the upstairs loo at Mount Stewart and my father and my Uncle Jack having to repair the door. She also had many happy times in Turnbury, where I was brought up. And while I remember all these times, I also recall her pride when two of her grandchildren, Andrew and Catherine, graduated from graduating from their respective universities and in her 80s being able to attend both ceremonies. Uh, then, in the year before she died, crossing the Atlantic um, for her grandson Andrew's wedding in Virginia where she displayed great stamina during the long day uh, and reception. So in conclusion, um, Jenny made Kirkintilla her home. She loved it and its community. She served it well and was loved and respected for that. And that I think is the lesson of where true value lies. Thank you. Um, surprisingly, I can lead in and away from the last presentation uh, because um, I can go back to my primary school days and I was in the same primary school class as Kenneth Hall. Um, and I was actually going to talk about another member of, uh, uh, I forget of the title slides, uh, Ivan Hayes. I was going to talk, um, be, begin, begin by talking about another member of that same class, uh, Jay Forrest. Um, and this is the other side of the political divide uh, uh, as, as compared um, to uh, what we've been hearing about. Uh, but Jay Forrest's father uh, was uh, councillor Jimmy Forrest, who was a Labour councillor uh, in Kirkintilla. And he knew um, the MP, the one that defeated uh, Willie Whitelaw, uh, Cyril Benz, uh, quite well. And I would go about the forest house and I would hear the names 
of all the great uh, Labour politicians of the post-war government uh, and, on, and, and further on in the post-war years uh, in the Forest's house. Um, and um, I remember hearing about, uh, he, he, hearing him talking about Cyril Benz, but they also mentioned a lot of other names, but they were nearly all men in the post-war years in the in the, the senior ranks of the Labour Party. But one woman did stand out, and that, in, in my memory, and that was Jenny Lee, um, who was uh, really quite well known as a politician, um, especially a, a, a little later on, as I'll explain. Uh, next slide, Ivan, please. This is Jenny Lee. Um, she was married to Nye Bevan. We'll talk about that in a wee while. Nye Bevan, of course, being the Minister of Health uh, in the post-war uh, Labour government. Uh, but strangely enough, uh, I had no idea when I heard her being talked about. I didn't even know she was Scottish. And I certainly didn't know that she had a local connection. Uh, but uh, can we have the next slide, Ivan, please? And Again, strangely, um, I got to know about Jenny Lee's um, local connection from a very staunch conservative that I knew well. And this was uh, Willie Ewer, uh, who lived in Bishop Briggs. Uh, and Willie um, produced two books of Bishop Briggs, and I edit edited these books for him. Uh, one of them in... Uh, 1987 and one of them in 1989. Um, this is his earlier book which dealt with uh, Bishop Briggs between the wars. And next slide, Ivan. And he also um, had another book that covered Bishop Briggs in the post-war years. And he was very well qualified to talk about the post-war years because he was a councillor in Bishop Briggs uh, when Bishop Briggs became a borough in 1964. And there was lots of politics in these books. And in fact, uh, there's a lot about the, the establishment of the borough in, in Bishop Briggs in, in 1964. It was strange that uh, Strathkelvin then had, uh, as when it was formed uh, in 1975, had one of the oldest Scottish boroughs in Kirkintilla and one of the very youngest Scottish boroughs in Bishop Briggs, uh, which only, um, started in 1964. But in his books, uh, being a very political person, uh, uh, Willie had lots of politics, but he always tried to be even-handed. And it's through his even-handedness in his books that I found out about Jenny Lee. Next slide, please. Uh, it's in the golden years, the earlier of the two books, um, that he talks about Jenny Lee. Next slide again. So here is um, uh, Willie Ewer's piece about um, politics in Bishop Briggs and indeed in Northwest Lanark uh, between the wars. Uh, he lists the various uh, MPs for North Lanark and Bishop Briggs being in that constituency. These were the MPs for Bishop Briggs. And as you can see, they included uh, Jenny Lee, uh, who had two brief spells, uh, one after the other. Uh, she won a by-election and then a, an election, uh, but she didn't last long at Bishop Briggs. And in fact, when she went out of Parliament in 1931, she didn't come back in again until 1945. But uh, Willie Ewer's text is very interesting here. Uh, Jenny Lee captured many hearts as well as a lot of votes. She was quite a young girl when she stood. In fact, um, there were very few uh, Scottish women MPs between the wars because it was only after the First World War that um, we had any women MPs. So uh, I suppose Jenny Lee was one of the earliest Scottish uh, women MPs. Uh, she was quite a young girl when she stood and was elected in 1929. And she was, as she still is, very beautiful. Uh, that was tempting fate a little because this book was published in 1987 and uh, Jenny Lee died in, in 1988, the, the following year. Uh, but she lived to the good old age of 84. Uh, so 
Um, she, she did well to retain her looks, if that was the case, as Willie suggests. The mining community in particular were all for her. Her union, unionist opponent at the two 1929 election, elections was the delightful Lord Schoon, often referred to at election meetings as Mr. Schoon or Lord Scon. Uh, one of his posters at these elections read, Lee, Lee, Elaine, but they didn't. And Jenny Lee later married an Iron Devon. She actually married him in 1934. Next slide. Now, Jenny Lee was always a very formidable lady, uh, even from the, the, from the pre-war years. And certainly she was a well-known figure uh, in the post-war years. Uh, and she didn't really give second best uh, uh, in, in many ways to her husband, Nye Bevan, who was, of course, one of the most famous of all the post-war uh, Labour ministers. And Nye Bevan, in fact, and I'll come back to this again later, was really, he, he was Minister of Health in the post-war Labour government. Therefore, more than anybody else, he was the the man responsible for establishing uh, the, the National Health Service. So that is, is, is quite significant. Jenny Lee also had some very significant roles that I'll come back to in a minute. But this is her blue plaque, this is their blue plaque rather, uh, at their house in Chelsea. And Iron Bevan, 1897 to 1960, and Jenny Lee, 1904 to 1988. Politicians lived here between 1944 and 1954. So as you can see, Jenny Lee um, is mentioned in, a, in an equally prominent way uh, to uh, Nye Bevan, who was really one of the outstanding politicians of that era. Uh, next slide, please. So getting back to Jenny and what she was all about, um, in fact, uh, she only really came into her own after Nye Bevan uh, died in 1960. Uh, she became a minister in uh, Harold Wilson's government of 1964. Uh, she actually became the Minister for Culture. And as the Minister for Culture, she was the person more than any other that was responsible for establishing the Open University. So that was a very great favour in her cap. As Minister of Culture, she also improved a lot of the Arts Council uh, in different parts uh, of England, especially, uh, and in London, really, especially. But so she did a lot to improve the, the Arts Council. But her real uh, contribution uh, was the establishment of the Open University. So just as her husband had been the man that more than anybody else established the National Health Service, so Jenny was the person more than anybody else that established the Open University. So she really was um, a, a, a significant uh, woman, woman politician, uh, probably being forgotten about now, I would imagine. There's not many people will remember her, uh, but she was a local MP uh, in this area uh, during the 1930s or late 20s, early 30s, as I explained. Uh, and Bishop Briggs is not very far away from here. Uh, and we have lots of links to Bishop Briggs. I was giving a talk in Bishop Briggs last night. Uh, so G Jenny Lee, very interesting person, very significant woman politician. Uh, and when she died herself, um, as I mentioned, that was in 1988, uh, she donated all her papers to the Open University, uh, and they still have a Jenny Lee collection. However, I, I'm going to talk about uh, somebody else, a specific person, and I think I'm unique uh, tonight. I'm going to talk about someone who is uh, very much alive. Could we have the first slide, please, Ivan? Uh, it's this lady, Karine Polwart. Um, and uh, if we go to the next slide, you'll find out just who she is and what she does. Uh, the picture on the right there kind of gives it away. Uh, Karine is a singer and songwriter, uh, originally from the folk scene, but working uh, extensively across the, the music and theatre uh, 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 scene in Scotland and throughout the UK. And there is a local connection because she was born in Banknock, 
uh, at the end of December 1970. Uh, she's a, a, a very intelligent lady. She's got a first class honours degree in philosophy from Dundee University and then a master's from Glasgow, uh, following which she worked in Scottish Women's Aid for six years before becoming a professional musician. And her experiences in that have uh, influenced her songwriting very strongly. A lot of it deals in women's issues, sort of problems they face and the difficulties and dilemmas that they, they, they face. Uh, so she was actually nearly 30 before she became a professional musician, which is very late in the game, but uh, it allowed her to have experience of real life, which has uh, served, served very well to develop her, uh, both as a singer and a songwriter, because she'd obviously been performing in folk clubs and sessions and things before that. But she started out uh, as a member of two of Scottish, uh, Scotland's folk scene's foremost uh, groups of the time, uh, Malinke and Battlefield Band. Uh, I'm a big folk music fan and I love live music. Uh, and the first, or my first memory of seeing Kareen uh, is uh, when she was with the Battlefield Band in about 2001 uh, in Nettlebed Folk Club. Uh, I was living near near Reading at, at, uh, at the time, working down there. And uh, Nettlebed, which is north of Henley in the Dilterns, uh, was my nearest uh, folk club. And uh, she initially was, was Battlefield Band there. Subsequently, she became a solo artist and I saw her there uh, and on a number of occasions and in some, um, bleh, a number of different venues since, uh, as well as working as a solo artist and with her own trio and group. She uh, works with numerous collaborations with other artists in the music and theatre field and uh, is very extensively known in the Scottish uh, music and, and art scene. Who would we have the next uh, slide, please, Simon? This was her debut album, uh, Fault Lines, in 2003. And it made a very big splash in the folk world indeed, uh, uh, indicated by the fact that, that the, the folk industry's uh, premier uh, awards event, the Radio 2 Folk Awards in 2005, she won three awards uh, for the first was the Horizon Award for the uh, uprising uh, uh, new artist, uh, the best album for Fault Lines, and the best original song for uh, this uh, tune that's on Coming Over the Hill, which is uh, one of the tunes, one of the songs on the album. Uh, as you can perhaps guess from the cover of the thing, uh, she deals with some pretty serious issues, as I say, often drawing on, on uh, some of the work that she'd done with uh, Women's Aid, but always in a very compassionate and humane way. She's someone with something serious and important to, uh, to say, but it does so in a measured and very uh, sympathetic way for the individuals concerned. Uh, next slide, please, Ivan. Uh, that she then went on to produce a number of uh, award uh, albums and win various awards since then. Uh, I've listed on the left there uh, the, the solo CDs, the solo albums that she's produced uh, since then. And on the right, uh, I've just again stuck with the awards at the, the, at the uh, Radio 2 Folk Awards because they're sort of the top the premier uh, event of the things. Uh, and uh, as well as the three that she picked up in the first year, she's had uh, two further uh, uh, awards of the best original song uh, of the year and been nominated on, on one other occasion. Uh, and uh, as well as that, uh, you'll uh, uh, note that in 2018 she was awarded the Folk Singer of the Year. So she's not only a very good and, and incisive songwriter, but she's an absolutely brilliant singer and interpreter, both of traditional songs, uh, her own songs, and songs by other contemporary artists. Uh, in short, uh, she's good. Uh, this is this is not uh, any lightweight, and a lot more information can be found at our website uh, down there, uh, kareenpolwart.com. Uh, next slide, please, Ivan. That's a selection of her uh, CDs there. That, that uh, I see, I'm I'm of the CD generation. <laughs> was, this is too late for for vinyl, and really before it came back into fashion. Um, I'll just draw your attention to the one in the middle. Uh, which is her most recent one, uh, Still As You're Sleeping, which uh, is just, uh, it's very much a lockdown uh, album. Uh, it's just her on, on voice and her uh, friend and, uh, Dave Milligan on piano, uh, a very simple arrangements, and they do a number of traditional songs, uh, some, some of her own uh, contemporary songs, which are very much relating to lockdown and the circumstances there, and a number of songs by other Scottish contemporary artists and other artists from elsewhere. It's absolutely beautiful. And uh, I can, if you weren't interested at all in learning more about Karina, I would start with that uh, on there. So a little bit more about how she operates. If we go to the next slide. In the top left there, uh, she normally plays as, as the Karine Polwart trio, 
which is very much a family affair. Uh, on the left there is her younger brother Stephen on guitar, and on the right, her best pal Inge Thompson uh, on harmony vocals and an assortment of other instruments to lend colour to the thing. So it's a very tight group of uh, people that have been playing together uh, since really she started out in, in music. Uh, she expands that to a full band on occasion and, of course, on the albums. Uh, there's a number of different artists brought in to add various uh, uh, tones and, and textures to the, to the music. Um, she's lived for uh, a number of years in Pathhead, south of Edinburgh, and she's very interested and keen on nature and, and uh, green issues. And the, the picture below uh, that there is, is of Green uh, sat on a stone beside Fala Bog, uh, which is, a, a, as the name suggests, a, a bog, a flow, deep flow, uh, just south of, of Bathhead. And uh, this inspired a, a, a sort of joint theatrical and musical uh, work that she put together in 2016-17, uh, A Pocket of Wind Resistance. And the image on the right is a still from that, with the, the, the bog is sort of in, in the flask there, indicating the fragility of it, and herself uh, looking suitably serious about the potential threats. Uh, to the, the ecosystems there if we don't uh, change our ways very much uh, strong on the green issues as well as uh, a number of other social and uh, issues on there. However, it's not all doom and gloom and if we move to the next slide, uh, this is one of her, uh, if you like, lighter things. I mean, she does write a number of uplifting and inspiring songs as well as the very serious ones. Um, but uh, a few years ago, uh, she uh, got together with the trio and with uh, three other uh, Scottish Indian pop musicians to uh, produce this uh, her Scottish songbook, uh, which started out uh, as an act at festivals and things like that, and got more and more popular and grew and grew, and um, eventually produced uh, an album and uh, a, a, a tour of major venues. Uh, although it's called her Scottish songbook, it's very largely covers of 80s pop songs by Scottish artists, which of course was her teenage years when she was growing up. So uh, I think more than half the songs on the uh, on the album are actually uh, from that era. There are some more recent songs and uh, a few older ones by people like Jerry Rafferty and uh, John Martin. Uh, so it, it is contemporary so it's, uh, song on there. And uh, it, it's really, it really took off and played in Radio Scotland and various places uh, and was hugely successful. And uh, in fact, the last uh, concert of hers that I actually uh, saw was one of these ones in, in the Usher Hall in Edinburgh. She's, for two nights, she sold the play out, sold, sold the plates out, uh, full house. Uh, and I was there for one of them uh, with, with friends. Uh, absolutely fantastic. Uh, a great night was had by, uh, uh, by one and all. So an artist of considerable range and uh, uh, dexterity and someone who's very, very highly regarded within the, uh, the industry. And if we could go to the final slide of the actual presentation. Uh, why is uh, she uh, an inspiring female role model? Well, basically to start with, she's good. Uh, she's a sing As a singer, she's got a lovely voice, which uh, with age and experience, she really uses to bring the heart out in every song, uh, bring the, the, the feeling out of it without going over the top, but just getting to the core of it. Uh, as a songwriter, she deals with a wide range of issues, seriously and uh, you know, sensitively and compassionately. Uh, and again, over a fairly wide range of topics, I've, uh, I've just put a little list, women's issues, family and uh, fa family complexities, social issues, nature, and various other things as well in there. And uh, she doesn't just stick in the folk uh, uh, scene, as it were, or singer songwriter. She's collaborated widely with musicians and uh, thespians uh, from a wide range of backgrounds folk, pop, classical, jazz, and on one occasion uh, she uh, formed with the Scottish uh, Chamber Orchestra uh, at the, one of the Celtic Connections uh, festivals a few years back at King's Theatre. Again, an absolutely tremendous occasion. Uh, although she's a, basically a very serious person and uh, uh, deals with serious issues, she also has a lighter side and realises the need to uh, leaven the bread a bit and, and to make, mix uh, up some lighter and uh, uplifting and inspiring songs. And is very much highly respected, and someone who's achieved success on their own terms, uh, it does not conform to sort of music industry norms or anything like that. Right, to be a pop star, she's done it by the sheer quality of her uh, of her work, her ability to interpret traditional and other contemporary songs in a sensitive and, and way that communicates well, and by right incisive uh, songs 
on her own. So uh, that's why uh, she's, a, a, I believe, an inspiring female role model, a model not only for young women wanting to move into the music industry, but uh, also to anyone, from men or otherwise, to uh, do, do it your own way and uh, stand your ground and uh, work makes uh, win success on, on your own terms. So that's my uh, inspiring female role model. Well, after the last presentation, that brings me to my choice for an aspiring female role model. And I've picked somebody who has been linked to my area of um, uh, professional life. That is Maria Gilbert Mayer. Uh, 1906 to 1972 and she was the second woman to win the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1963 but she's the second of a very short list because as far as I can see there have only ever been three women who have won the Nobel Prize in Physics and the last one was relatively recently in 2018. Well, Maria Gilbert was born on the 20th of June, 1906, in Katowice, Prussia, because she was born in the days of the German Empire. And this is her as a baby on the left and as a teenage girl on the right. But she moved to Göttingen in Germany, well, Germany as it now stands, in Saxony in 1910, when her father secured a post in the university as professor of pediatrics. This was a very academic family, and her father, in fact, was a sixth generation uh, member of academic staff within the, the German Empire. So in 1924, Maria, as a young woman, as shown here, entered the university there to study mathematics. Um, the mathematics course was primarily designed for school teaching, but nevertheless, during that time, she got interested in physics and she stayed on in the university and did a PhD, which uh, she had her thesis defended and awarded in 1930. And this was a PhD in theoretical physics. With the thesis entitled Elementary Processes with Two Photon Transitions. Now, right, what's a photon? Well, a photon is uh, the particle of light. And normally, if you shine light onto something which glows, you're observing individual photons and then you get luminescence or fluorescence. But it's a very rare process that two photons could be simultaneously absorbed for the same excitation process. So for example, on the right here, we have uh, an ultraviolet photon at 266 nanometers, exciting an atom from the ground state as it's called up to an upper state or two photons of half the energy, but twice the wavelength could possibly also do it. In the 1920s, when Maria was a student, that was a time when quantum mechanics, which is the mechanics of very small objects, was being developed. That uh, replaced uh, classical mechanics, which was the mechanics of uh, Newton back hundreds of years previously. And Germany was really at the fore of quantum mechanics. So it was a, a natural area of research for Maria to study theoretically. And this was a quantum mechanical process that she worked on. That was her thesis, 1930. But she had time to do other things as well, because in 1930, she married Joseph Meyer, and he was a visiting US scholar who just happened to be lodging with the Gilbert family in Göttingen. And then after her PhD, after getting married, as shown here, she and Joseph moved to the United States to John Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland, and eventually had a family, two children, and the left-hand photograph shows Maria with one of the children. Joseph uh, was a distinguished chemist in his own right uh, and worked in various universities in the United States. So obviously the training of Maria, but what about her career? Well, we're talking about the second woman to win the Nobel Prize in physics, but basically she never had a career. So it's only a career of sorts. 
because there were sort of anti-nepotism rules in the United States at that time in universities and in the government. You could interpret them as anti-nepotism from the point of view of um, not allowing husbands and wives to be employed by the same organization. But there were definitely anti-women rules as well, because it was to make space for the breadwinner, the so-called breadwinner, which was the man during the Depression. So this was a result of the Depression in the 1930s. So she could not be employed by John Hopkins University, but she was so interested in physics, she worked for nothing. So she had an unpaid research post. And that enabled her to talk to people, enabled her to use the library. And she wasn't an experimentalist, she didn't have to have laboratories. And then, unfortunately, her husband got fired from John Hopkins because his wife was around the department too much. It was very much a male dominated faculty in the university. And he moved to New York to Columbia University in 1939, and she came with him again. She had no post. So we're talking with somebody who's clearly very talented. Her first paid work of any sort was in 1941, when she got a part-time post in the Sarah Lawrence Liberal Arts College, which is still in existence in Yonkers in the New York area. That was a part-time teaching job, not a research post, but a teaching job. And here is her, shown here, second from the right, in this group sitting around the table, in the Sarah Lawrence College at that time. That took her throughout the Second World War from 1941 through to 1945. Uh, during that time then, she was asked to join the Manhattan Project. That's the development of the atomic bomb. And uh, the letter here, which you're not obviously meant to be able to read, is a letter sent from Columbia University to the president of um, the Sarah Lawrence College requesting her release in 1943. So she did part-time research there, but also still continued on with some links to the college, some teaching. Um, it was to do with materials, and materials were important in making of the bomb and the purification of the components of the bomb. Then again, when the Second World War finished, um, so did her opportunity of working at Columbia, and she moved again with her, her husband when her husband moved to Chicago University. And again, she was in an unpaid research post, which lasted from 46 through to 1960. However, she did manage to get a paid job, and that was a half time paid job as a senior physicist. That was her job title at the new Argonne National Laboratory, Chicago. And this was set up by the new Atomic Energy Commission to do with uh, nuclear energy. And again, she was working on theoretical nuclear physics there. And the right-hand photograph shows her with her colleagues. And you can see she is the only woman in this photograph uh, with all her male colleagues at the Argonne Laboratory. That takes us up to 1960. So what age was she now? She was now 54 years of age. And she only had a a couple of part-time paid jobs in her career. Well, in 1950, she published an important paper linked to what she'd been doing since the 1940s with the grand title of nuclear configuration and spin or with coupling model. What this was to do with, it was to do with theoretical analysis um, modeling of the the nucleus of the atomic atom using quantum mechanical principles. Eventually in 1960, she and Joseph both got full-time jobs at the University of California in San Diego. And that was her first permanent paid job. However, they obviously had a, made a good choice at the selection panel because in 1963, she was awarded the share of the Nobel Prize for work on the nuclear shell model, or the model of the nuclear nucleus. Um, she died uh, quite soon afterwards uh, following a heart attack and the stroke. 
And the left-hand photograph shows Maria at her desk, and you notice what she is holding in her hand. Uh, the, I was going to say the older members of the audience would recognize what it is, but I think all of us fall into the same category. It is a slide rule, which uh, we used to have to learn to use at school in the pre-calculator era. And the right-hand photograph shows her invited back in 1960 to uh, the Chicago University Hugman A party, which looks a very formal affair there. So her, her Nobel Prize wasn't just based, of course, on the 1950 paper. It was based on all the work she'd been doing previously. But of course, all of that work previously was done while she was a part-time, on-paid researcher. And this is Maria with uh, King Gustav VI of uh, Stockholm receiving the Nobel Prize on 10th of December 1963. It was shared as Nobel Prizes normally are shared because people are working across the world independently with uh, informal collaborations from time to time on um, the same subject matter. She did not work with these two, Hans Jensen and Eugene Wigner, but uh, she worked in the same area and uh, they all were nominated at the same time for the Nobel Prize. Now, I just want to go back to your 1930 doctoral thesis. There's a bit of physics on this, um, this slide. Although she won the Nobel Prize for the Nobel nuclear physics work, in some ways she's better remembered for the work from her 1930s thesis. And my link with her, from a research point of view, is to do with this subject matter. I'll just explain what's going on here. I remember I said um, atoms and molecules absorb photons of light and give out fluorescence. So the left hand part of um, the diagram shows a, a blue or an ultraviolet photon being absorbed and then the material given out a green photon. Or that could be equivalent to two red being absorbed and one green being emitted. And if you look at the photograph down below, the point is that two photon excitation is very, very rare. It could not be observed in her day. So when she was doing this theoretical work, she had no idea if this could ever be observed. And it was not observable onto the coming of the lasers in the 1960s. And that's because it's very rare, it needs an awful lot of photons, and a normal lamp does not produce enough photons at the same time. So, for example, if you look at the left-hand side, this is a microscope lens, a microscope objective, and it's, it's, it's focusing a blue or really an ultraviolet laser beam into this uh, fluorescing dye. And you can see a bright track of light come through here where the luminescence is coming out of the liquid. But if you look at the right-hand one, this is modeling what's going on up here. It's focusing in uh, red light, and only at the focus, you can see a tiny, tiny little speck there at the tip of uh, my pointer. And that is the two photon excited fluorescence. Very, very faint. And it's so faint that the unit of measurement is named after Maria, and it's named the GM. And this is a measure of this quantity. And one GM is one by 10 to the minus 50. That's the decimal point followed by 49 zeros. And it's in a very odd unit, centimeter to the four second photon to the minus one. It's to do with the number of photons crossing a unit area per time bombarding something. And that could only be obtained at the focus of a very powerful laser and hence she did the work in 1930, but with no idea that this could ever be observed, but it was called TPF, two photon excited fluorescence, is um, an important practical uh, phenomenon in laser physics, photonics, and it's used as a form of microscopy because it 
you can use intense light without damaging biological samples, which you cannot do with normal um, microscopy in this case. And my link to it, without going into any detail, is uh, my last area of research was to do with sensing. Uh, that is measuring temperature remotely using optical fibers. And I'm the co-inventor of a technique that uses pulses of light going in opposite directions in a fiber generating this uh, fluorescence the two photons. Um, if you want to sometime, you can read all these uh, bullet points here, which are lifted off a talk I gave at some point in the past, but it relies on fibers containing fluorescent material and the, the laser pulses generate the fluorescence only at one point where you want it to be generated. And hence you can shift that along the fiber at will and measure over kilometers at different uh, temperatures at different locations to precision of centimeters if necessary. So that is uh, this, the, my subject matter and she is commemorated. She's commemorated back where she grew up, Kat, now Katowice in Silesia in Poland, because remember the frontier at the end of the Second World War moved westwards between Germany and Poland. And of course, Poland became an independent at the end of uh, the First World War. So she's commemorated in this mural on a building. She's commemorated on, the, on a building itself where her family lived. Um, the American Physical Society, that's the physics um, uh, professional body, has a uh, Maria Gabriel Award for Outstanding Physics Research by a Woman, and that was instituted in 1986. There's a crater on Venus, a 35 kilometer diameter crater, and she was commemorated in 2011 on a US postage stamp. So here we have uh, Maria again. And uh, in my view, she is uh, an inspiring female role model because she was an outstanding physicist. She lived the archetypal um, academic life in a sort of selfless way with no proper career and no sort of thought and sense for her own material gain. And I, I've seen that quite often in universities. Uh, people who work uh, seven days a week solely to get a result to present at a conference or to publish in a paper. She worked, as I said, in a non-paid way, but she's still a devoted wife. She followed her husband from one post to another when he was uh, getting uh, paid work. Uh, he, she followed him like a sort of camp follower in some ways. And she showed this determination th throughout her career. She was focused on what she wanted to do and just kept at it and it paid off in her case. 